This is the recorded lecture for cervical and thoracic conditions. Um, I will hit the high points of a lot of these conditions briefly in class, but this allows us to move to lab a little quicker and do more case studies uh, that are related to cervical and thoracic conditions that we see in the clinic quite often. So the first one that we're going to cover is torticollis. Um, this is sometimes referred to as wry neck or cervical scoliosis, but more typically you hear just the term torticollis. Uh, it can occur in all age ranges. It is more common in infants. Uh, usually if an infant has it, they are born with it. Uh, but commonly, no matter what the age range, uh, what you basically have is asymmetry in the function of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. That muscle is typically in spasm, it has a lot of severe tightness, and because it's unilateral, only affecting one side, the head tends to be side bent to one side and then, of course, rotated to the opposite side, matching the function of that muscle. So in this little guy, he would have a right torticollis. He's right side bent, left rotated. Causes, as far as in infants, it's usually congenital. Um, basically, it began to occur in utero before birth, or it can occur due to an injury during the birth process. Uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle tends to be very fibrotic, very shortened. It could have had um, several months of developing this way in utero, and that's your main cause when it comes to uh, seeing it in infants. In conditions of adults, such as hemiplegia or traumatic brain injury, where one side of the body is affected more than others, you can definitely see some asymmetry in that sternocleidomastoid function, weakness on one side, causing stretching on one side of the neck and shortening on the other, and that can lead to a torticollis type of syndrome as well. Sometimes there is just no known cause of what might have brought about the torticollis, uh, but in adults there's also sometimes psychological stress and patients who have undergone uh, a very traumatic event that can sometimes end up what, with what is called hysterical torticollis. Uh, mechanically, a facet lock in the cervical spine can actually cause the patient's head to be positioned uh, similar side bent one way and rotated the other, and that's uh, typically treatable with uh, mobilization exercises. As far as overall treatment, this will vary a little bit if you're dealing with an adult patient or if you have a baby. Uh, definitely for all passive range of motion, active range of motion, lots of stretching and positioning. Uh, for adults, that home exercise program is very important. And for babies or young children, uh, having that home exercise program carried out by the caregiver or parent or um, whoever is in, you know, working with the child the most uh, when they're not in therapy. Heat and modalities help to improve flexibility and relax muscles. Obviously, in adults, we could add things in, such as electrical stimulation or ultrasound. Uh, definitely manual therapy in adults works really well. We can use those hold-relax techniques, agonistic contraction, in order to help lengthen the affected sternocleidomastoid muscle. Sometimes when it is more of a condition due to stress or the hysterical type of torticollis, biofeedback, relaxation exercises help a lot. Um, even just how a person or a baby is positioned makes a big difference. So, for example, if you have a child who is side bent to the right, it might be a good idea to position them in right side lying so that that brings the cervical spine more into neutral or more into the left side bending position. We'll talk about torticollis more in class. We'll do a little case study that involves that. And we'll talk about things like feeding and just overall positioning and how you would train parents when it comes to treating this condition. Because a lot of times it's a, it's a new mom or dad. They're already a little bit nervous. And then trying to teach them how to do range of motion and stretching in the neck can be something that some are not real comfortable with. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in class. The next condition is tension headaches. Uh, these are types of headache not like your typical migraine headache. So we have tension that's actually occurring in the posterior cervical muscles, oftentimes in that suboccipital region. Um, it's usually where the cervical extensors attach, um, even the sides, top of the scalp. And it's, it's typically something that is definitely related to either having an injury already 
or having very poor posture or poor sleep position. Uh, later on, we'll talk about temporal mandibular joint syndrome and its problems, and we'll see that oftentimes people that suffer from TMJ issues also suffer from tension headaches. Lots of people who have a lot of sinus issues, sinusitis, that type of thing, might also complain quite often of tension headaches. First of all, we need to break the pain cycle. Uh, modalities, massage, manual therapy, all are excellent things to help uh, with patients with tension headaches. You'll get some patients who wake up with headaches. Uh, I would definitely look at how are they sleeping, how many pillows are they using, what kind of mattress um, they might be on and things like that. Those are the patients that typically wake up with headaches. Other patients that have tension headaches get them as the day goes on. For those patients, we need to look at job tasks. What are they doing during the day? Um, are they sitting in very poor position at a workstation or a work desk or that type of thing? Um, basically, after we can kind of break into that pain cycle and help with that, we need to start exercises. We need to do isometrics. Remember what those do. They bring great blood flow to the muscles. Muscles need blood flow in order to take away waste products and improve the healing and, of course, decrease the pain. Uh, manual techniques like suboccipital release are wonderful for patients with tension headaches. We will practice a little bit of that in class. I know you did some of that in massage last spring. Range of motion, making sure patient has a home exercise program, and of course, postural re-education. Probably the most common type of cervical posture that you see in patients that have headache issues is going to be forward head posture, which, which we've already covered in our posture uh, class and lecture. Okay, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, which sometimes is referred to as thoracic inlet syndrome. If you remember learning about the scalene triangle and all of the structures that are within that area in kinesiology, it makes sense to realize that there's so much going on in that area that it can actually occur that you get impingement of the neurovascular bundle within there. So you've got the subclavian and artery and vein, you've got the brachial plexus itself, you've got the first rib, you've got scalene muscles, pectoralis minor muscles, all of that within kind of that same zone. And so basically this is a compression type of syndrome. Most common causes are that the patient has significant tightness in their scalene muscles or their pectoralis minor. Uh, sometimes that first thoracic rib position can sort of impinge on those neurovascular structures. Occasionally you'll actually get a patient that was um, diagnosed that they have an extra cervical rib and that again crowds the area up. This patient typically has the forward head, increased thoracic kyphosis, very protracted shoulders. That contributes to those muscles being very tight. And it also contributes to the fact that respiration-wise, they tend to be pretty much upper chest breathers. Um, they use accessory muscles quite a bit. The scalenes are so hypertrophied, um, and they're just huge uh, because of how they're breathing that they tend to not necessarily get good breath support, use their diaphragm, et cetera. Sometimes thoracic outlet syndrome can actually be caused by trauma. So you have somebody with a significant clavicle fracture, someone that was in a car accident with whiplash, uh, with or without fractures, and the trauma itself can bring about that swelling and that compression within that um, scaling triangle area. There's a good picture that kind of helps you appreciate all of the structures within there. And you can see how that area would get extremely crowded, especially if you, if you do have a patient that has that extra rib formed from the cervical spine. And it's, it's definitely something that can cause a lot of different symptoms. Okay. With those, we've got significant pain. We've got numbness. Um, but the key is it's not actually pain and numbness within where the scalene triangle is located. It's actually in the affected upper extremity. So this person might get tingling, numbness, pain, 
Um, they may even feel a little bit cold in their hands or in that extremity. And given enough time, because it is impinging on neural structures too, it could actually lead to weakness in that upper extremity. So you might get patients that say, oh, you know, I'm kind of clumsy. I pick up kind of a heavier frying pan and I just kind of lose it and I, and I can't keep my grip on it very well. Those are usually more chronic cases or patients that have been dealing with this for quite a while before they're actually getting some help. So treatment um, can always include modalities to help with pain and muscle relaxation. Typically it's gonna be over those tight muscles that the patient needs to relax and gain that flexibility back in. Definitely a lot of flexibility exercises. Those will emphasize all the pectoral muscles, major and minor, the scalenes. Scalenes are really hard to stretch on your own. Uh, so I'll actually show you a manual technique in class where we can stretch those out really, really well with a patient. And remember, the scalenes actually attach to the first rib. So uh, you not only will help improve flexibility, but you might be helping that patient's overall respiration status, too, when you get those stretched out. And then, of course, trapezius muscle that tends to be very tight, the upper trap primarily. We're going to have to strengthen, and that's going to be your scapular adductors and depressors. We already kind of said this person might have forward shoulders, increased thoracic kyphosis. Those muscles that are very stretched in the posterior part of the spine are definitely going to be weak and need strengthening, as are the cervical and thoracic extensor muscles, too. We want to improve posture, whether that's sitting posture, head posture, standing posture, make sure that the patient understands that poor posture is going to lead to even more pain with this condition. Teaching them how to breathe again, diaphragmatic breathing, we'll do that in class as well, it's training a patient how to actually breathe correctly. And you'll be surprised at the number of patients that you have that really don't realize that they're not breathing uh, correctly, when, when, especially when um, inspiration is occurring. If conservative treatment just does not seem to work, this is a, can be a chronic condition, the patient has significant pain, um, their job requires a lot of abnormal postures that they're in, they will occasionally do some type of surgical intervention. Typically, this is some kind of a decompression. So they call it a thoracic outlet decompression. Basically, when you hear the term decompression, it's just like it sounds. They are relieving pressure that is occurring within that neurovascular bundle that, that we have. Sometimes they don't know until they go in what they're going to do. They may actually take out that first rib. They may actually excise part of the rib, or they may go in and remove part of the muscle groups that are affected, or even do a repair of the vein or artery that's been compressed for so long. Okay, moving on, we're going to talk about TMJ, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction. Uh, there are a few clinics in the Quad Cities where they have people, uh, PT, PTAs, who work a lot with patients with TMJ. Sometimes our referral source for these patients isn't even a physician. It could be a dentist or an orthodontist. Um, a lot of times people have jaw pain with this, and so they assume it's a tooth problem, it's a dental problem, and they go see their dentist, who then diagnose them with, nope, it's not really so much your teeth as it is your chewing uh, joint, the TMJ. So causes, forward head is usually what starts the process. Um, if you guys are sitting here listening to this, put your head forward and see right away what that does with the resting position of your tongue because that's going to come back to us more often than not with patients with TMJ dysfunction that the resting position of their tongue is extremely poor, it's improper. Um, we're going to find that sometimes these are teeth clinchers. These are people who instead of their tongue resting very lightly on the on just the um, upper palate of the mouth, their tongue is actually on the floor of their mouth in a resting position. That can cause a lot of jaw problems, malocclusion, and they tend to end up being mouth breathers quite a bit too. TMJ can actually get started because of some kind of trauma, getting punched in the face, whiplash, uh, having significant oral surgeries where they had to work within that area, um, even trauma uh, dental-wise, so a person falls, fractures their jaw, that type of stuff um, can, can bring about TMJ dysfunction. And then you might actually have patients that are diagnosed with arthritis in the TMJ. It's a joint that can get 
affected by arthritis just like other joints in the body and so that brings on the same kind of symptoms um, that we'll talk about when it comes to TMJ. Just a slide here to show why uh, forward head posture is such a problem. When you look at how much the head weighs itself, you might have a head that weighs 8 to 10 pounds, um, which is typical for humans. And when you're in proper alignment, your pressure that is on the cervical spine really is nothing at all. It's, the, it's zero pounds. It's not excess pressure within the cervical spine. But for every inch of forward head posture that we have, you're adding at least 10 pounds of pressure to the spine. So, and, and then when you go an inch past that, you're talking it could even double the pressure on the spine. So it really is something that if we can help with forward head posture, there are so many different conditions that will be improved by that when it comes to our patients. And in class with posture, we talked about and we did exercises that will really help improve forward head posture. Okay, symptoms of TMJ include lots of pain. Pain is in the jaw typically. It can be bilateral, but more commonly you're going to see it be uh, a unilateral issue affecting just one side. The pain can not only be in the jaw, but it can spread to the ear. Um, you have that in combination with that forward head posture, and it can lead to a lot of those muscle tension headaches we've already talked about. When the person goes to eat um, or open their mouth or talk, you might actually get the jaw locking. They can have some popping, some crepitus, clicking of the jaw. Um, a lot of times their opening of their mouth it, uh, becomes diminished. So this patient goes to open their mouth to eat, and they can hardly open it um, enough to even fit like a bite of a sandwich in there. So they may say it's difficult, it's painful when I try to chew. And what they're eating makes a difference too. Um, if they're chewing a lot of gum, they're eating crunchy, harder foods, that can be a little bit more difficult for them also. So some of them, by the time they come to see us for therapy, they've already altered uh, what they do. They squish down their food so they don't have to open their mouth very wide. Um, they eat a lot of softer foods um, just kind of as a, as a result of all the pain that they've been having. Treatment is really unlike or uh, about the same as other joints in the body when it comes to arthritic type conditions, and that would include modalities. We can actually do some ultrasound using a small sound head to the TMJ. Iontophoresis, which I know you guys haven't had yet, but it involves electrical using an electrical simulation current in order to drive medication into a joint area. And then microcurrent also is another form of electrical stimulation that's very gentle and can be used uh, around the temporal mandibular joint to help with pain. Posture, can't say enough about that. Education and exercise, very, very important when it comes to that. And we have in our handout specific TMJ exercises. Those typically involve correcting the resting tongue position. We've already said the end third of the tongue needs to just sit nicely on the hard palate behind the front teeth. That's where your tongue should be in a resting position. When you're not talking, you're not eating, when you're just resting, um, that's where it should go. And most of these patients with TMJ dysfunction, that is not where it is. Um, the Roccobato Institute was one of the first institutes to come out with a TMJ uh, exercise sequence. They recommend TTB, tongue is up, teeth are apart, and breathe through the nose. And a lot of times those are three things that are abnormal in our patients anyway. And so um, if you can get your patient understanding that normal rest position, not clenching the teeth, that's going to take all the pressure off of that TMJ like it should. I did forget to mention, too, when it came to symptoms, sometimes when the patient goes to open their mouth, uh, the jaw will deviate towards one side. So that's usually part of the PT evaluation, looking at what is the opening of the mouth when uh, the patient opens up and uses those TMJ joints, and then also does it deviate towards one side, which it often will because one side is affected. Okay. We're going to talk now, uh, just in general terms, about what radiculopathy is. 
Radiculopathy is actually when you get some type of compression or inflammation of a nerve root. So it isn't just going to be cervical spine related. We can have radiculopathy that occurs in other body areas. We'll talk about it when it comes to the lumbar spine here as well during this unit. But cervical radiculopathy itself just means a nerve root has some sort of compression and then therefore inflammation uh, affecting it. So things like degenerative disc disease can occur in the cervical spine. We actually have a breakdown of the discs, an arthritic type of condition that can cause inflammation of the nerve roots as they exit the spine. We've got bony impingement. When the body has trauma, and especially trauma to the spine, the best thing sometimes it can do is try to grow bone. And unfortunately, it can cause some bone spurs, some osteophytes, some extra formation of bone growth, and where they grow might actually inflame or compress a nerve root as it exits the spine. There's also a condition called spinal stenosis. I've got a couple pictures of those coming up. That's where the spinal canal or the lateral foramen of the, of the spine actually becomes narrowed. And again, it's usually due to bone growth. You can have herniated discs, or what we would call an HNP, or a herniated nucleus propulsus. That herniated jelly-like material that's in the spine can actually work its way out and cause compression, cause inflammation, and cause irritation to those nerve roots as well. And then cervical spondylosis is just kind of a general term where we're saying the cervical spine weight-bearing structures, so the disc itself, the facet joints, you get chronic wear and tear on those. And with cervical spondylosis, it's definitely a condition that can lead to a lot of pain and a lot of radiculopathy for a patient. Here's a good picture that kind of shows nerve root entrapment. You get facet degeneration or you get arthritis or you get narrowing within the canal and this will definitely cause nerve root inflammation and, and cause what we would say is a radiculopathy. Think of a radiculopathy as pain is distal to where the actual pathology is occurring. There would be a narrowed central canal spinal stenosis and so we get actual pressure on the spinal cord itself. And there would be more of a lateral recess stenosis, meaning it's coming out of the foramen as the nerve root exits. Now, when you think about that lower picture there and where the actual narrowing is occurring, what we're getting is pressure along that, that mixed nerve. Because remember, as it comes out of the spinal cord, it's a mixed nerve. It contains sensory tracts and it contains motor tracts. So it isn't uncommon that radiculopathy is going to involve both sensory and motor deficits for a patient. So the symptoms would be this patient does have neurological signs. They might have weakness. Where they have weakness really helps us know where this is occurring. So if they have weakness in their biceps, this could tell me it's coming from C5 area of the spine. Uh, decreased neck range of motion. Eventually, because it's painful to move the neck, person kind of stops doing that, and so they become very stiff. And then their main symptom might be upper extremity pain, but not even have a whole lot of neck pain with this. And that's just part of that idea of what a radiculopathy actually is. So treatment-wise, we can always add modalities to help decrease pain. We want that for a patient, especially if they have a lot of muscle guarding and spasm because of it. Traction itself, I know you guys won't have traction yet until next semester, but we can actually do manual traction on a patient, or it can be mechanical using an actual machine to put many pounds of pressure um, to distract those joint surfaces so that we decrease the compression and we decrease the irritation on the spine. Uh, we will do some manual cervical traction in class this semester. Isometrics, range of motion, stretching, course posture exercises. Um, you're kind of beginning to see the theme here that there's probably not going to be one spinal condition that we talk about that doesn't warrant postural uh, re-education for our patients. If the patient actually has a herniated disc or a herniated nucleus propulsus or they have a spondylosis, uh, the PT from the evaluation is going to determine if flexion 
or extension exercises are appropriate. Um, we don't see as many herniated discs in the cervical spine as we do in the lumbar spine, but we have to know whether or not it is appropriate to do flexion or extension because the goal is to relieve that compression and relieve that irritation on the nerve roots. If the patient actually has the spinal stenosis, whether it's central canal or whether it's a lateral uh, Freeman stenosis, it is always indicated to do flexion exercises. That actually helps open up the um, joint space and allows uh, less stress and less pressure within that nerve root area. So think that all the way through, even when we get to the lumbar spine, if the patient has spinal stenosis, you always want to do flexion-based exercises and definitely not extension exercises. Surgery-wise, sometimes, especially if you're dealing with a full disc herniation or you've got patients with just such significant bone spurring um, and excess bone formation, a lot of times they will have to just go in surgically. Um, that's the only way that this radiculopathy can actually be improved upon. So I've listed there for you some different types of surgical approaches that they might do. It can involve anything from um, fixing the disc itself or actually doing a fusion within the cervical spine, especially if the patient has a little uh, instability in the cervical spine. Typical post-surgery is that they're going to be in a collar. I'll show you guys a Miami collar in class. Uh, it really restricts motion for a while post-surgery. And so we will follow up with physical therapy, especially once the patient is allowed to have the collar removed and we can get that range of motion and strength back in the neck. So occasionally you might have somebody who has a radiculopathy, but it doesn't seem to follow a dermatome pattern, okay? When we know that we have something going on in the spine uh, that's physically causing the radiculopathy, it's going to follow a pattern. We're going to get an idea of, is it C5, 6, you know, what level of the cervical spine is it coming from based on the patient's symptoms. But if you've got somebody who's just saying they have constant pain, um, there's nothing that we seem to be able to do special test-wise or movement-wise that reproduces or helps decrease the pain. It's just there all the time. Um, or if it's just constant sharp shooting pain, doesn't, like I said, seem to matter what, what we do. Nothing really relieves it. This is a red flag. And this is something that we would want to refer back to the doctor because this type of upper extremity pain could, in fact, be a cardiac problem, um, could be cancer in some areas. Uh, a lot of those types of conditions refer pain to the shoulder and upper extremity. And, um, you know, our whole idea in PT is if it's musculoskeletal and it's mechanical, we can reproduce the pain or we can figure out something that decreases the pain. And when we don't have that, that has to be considered a red flag. Okay, occasionally you'll get conditions where uh, the facets have actually locked within the cervical spine. This can be due to a significant injury or things like that, but basically the neck just feels stuck in one position. Typically they can flex really well or they walk around kind of with their head down in a flexed position looking at the ground. Uh, neck is very stiff, but when they try to extend, they try to look up, they are basically just stuck. And this is due to the facets actually locking. They'll get a lot of muscle guarding, a lot of spasm, even just the littlest jolt of a movement, you know, they kind of look too much or try to rotate too, too quickly to one side, they will typically get very severe pain um, within that side of where the facet lock is at. Treatment would be modalities to help get muscle relaxation, first of all. The PT will use muscle energy techniques to help unlock the facet. Um, we need to kind of figure out what the root cause was. It might have been a muscle imbalance in the first place. So after the fact, range of motion, strengthening, stretching um, the appropriate areas for sure. Definitely a lot of soft tissue work afterwards. This might be a patient that uh, facets are now fine, but they have a lot of associated tissue damage. That, that came with that locking occurring. And so um, it, it's not unlikely that we're going to spend some time doing a lot of soft tissue work and even massage with these patients. Posture, of course, comes into play. Maybe that was a factor in the first place. Maybe not. 
You've got conditions of the cervical spine that are more chronic, so they cause lack of range of motion within um, our cervical rotation, flexion, extension. And so that could be things like degenerative joint disease, spondylosis. Uh, this person might have had very prolonged poor posture, lack of range of motion. You know, typically if we're younger and we have poor posture, we don't develop pain uh, quite easily when we're young. It's when we get a little bit older that we start seeing the effects of this poor posture. When you refer back to that slide with the pressure and the poundage on the cervical spine, and then you also think about where the pressure is on the disc as compared to where it should be, you can see the cervical spine is undergoing just a lot of wear and tear. It's, it's pretty tough um, to deal with when you've had this over time. So this is someone a little bit more chronically, they've got kind of diffuse aching and pain. When they go to move their neck, it's pop, 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 like, you know, Rice Krispies, they've got crepitus in there. It's very, very stiff. And they, you know, this is the person that you kind of get scared of how are they even driving when they come to the clinic because you know in order to really look behind them when they're driving they have to rotate their entire body rather than being able to turn their head. We want to do, of course, modalities to help with that if those are indicated. Range of motion, strengthening and stretching exercises, always, of course, very appropriate. Posture, and then traction sometimes can alleviate a little spinal pressure and help uh, facilitate improved range of motion. And I think, you know, I haven't said it probably for any of these cervical patients, but the importance of maintaining what you gain with them, whether it's postural exercises, range of motion, strengthening exercises, the importance of keeping that up um, even after discharge from therapy because otherwise a lot of these conditions can just sort of rear their ugly head again if the patient doesn't follow through with um, an exercise program. So the next thing I want to talk about is having cervical sprains or strains, and usually these are associated with some type of injury. So we've all heard of whiplash. Sometimes whiplash is referred to as acceleration or deceleration injury of the cervical spine. And when you think about what happens in a car accident, if you've ever been in one or know of somebody that's been in one, um, think of sitting at a stoplight and getting rear-ended. Okay, the impact is initially going to cause hyperextension of the spine, okay? But then the opposite to that will occur as the body rebounds, you're gonna get hyperflexion of the spine. Um, typically, we're not perfectly rear-ended or we have accidents that are coming from the side or partially from one side rear-ended. So it isn't just straight flexion and extension, but it could be that that injury caused a combination of hyperextension and rotation to one side too. Um, the problem with whiplash is it's, we think of it as a muscular condition, but it really affects pretty deep structures in the spine. So besides like the traps, scalenes, all the erector spinae muscles, your rhomboids, the sternocleidomastoid, levator, all that, you've also got disc involvement sometimes, you've got those capsules of the facet joints, you've got ligaments. Um, think of your anterior and your posterior longitudinal ligaments and where they run from head down to the end of your spine. And those are all structures that are going to be affected, some of them being a lot deeper than others. So um, we've already talked about we know what kind of blood supply ligaments have. And so um, the healing process with pretty significant whiplash injuries can really uh, take its toll and it can take a long time for patients to recover. So I already talked about the rebound effect. Um, when, you, when you separate it out, whether the injury is hyperflexion or hyperextension, I've listed there your typical muscles that are affected. A lot of times though with your patients, they are having pain throughout. They have anterior pain, lateral pain, posterior pain, um, but that listed there is your primary muscles that are gonna be affected, making sense because you know your initial head movement is going to include the muscles that, that are going to be the most affected um, when the injury or the accident occurs. A lot of times right after an injury occurs, right after the whiplash, the patient doesn't really have any pain. 
Um, it isn't maybe sometimes until a couple hours later that they start getting stiffness, the body reacts by fibrous tissue formation in the affected muscles, we get a lot of inflammation, um, it becomes all of a sudden really difficult to move the head, to turn the head, um, the patient will begin in the next couple of days developing some tender points, some trigger points, um, even muscle spasms that might occur. Headache pain is also very common when it comes to the cervical spine. And when you have patients, especially where the whiplash affects the upper cervical spine, C1, C2, C3, we can actually get some symptoms like nausea and vertigo. Um, they may be even kind of light sensitive or noise sensitive. And, um, you know, you, you've affected structures within the inner ear itself too. So that kind of explains some of those associated symptoms. Next semester, we're gonna talk about dizziness and vertigo, and we will talk at it also from a standpoint of how does this occur when you have a whiplash injury or a cervical spine problem, because you definitely can have that. Treatment, listed them there, modalities, active range of motion and isometrics. Uh, back to the modalities, think again at what stage of injury you're in, whether you want to pick hot, cold, um, what type of ultrasound parameters you'd want to use. You know, when you're looking at some of the deeper structures, an ultrasound may have difficulty getting as deep as what we'd want for some patients. So it's definitely something to consider when it comes to the use of modalities with these patients. Gentle, active range of motion, like I said, isometrics initially. Um, sometimes your patients will be wearing a cervical collar just because it is so unbearable to not have one on. So we can actually start treatment with those isometrics with the patients still wearing the collar. Um, basically, you're going to use those isometrics to promote blood flow, but you're also going to use those isometrics just to get some movement and um, begin to get some lengthening on those, those really tight muscles. Uh, progress to stretching, eventually suboccipital techniques such as suboccipital release, lots of soft tissue work. Um, you guys haven't done much with positional release or trigger points yet, but you will next semester when you do a lot of manual therapy techniques in seminar class. Those are great for the cervical spine. And then, of course, posture. Um, if we're in pain, we tend to just find a position that really feels comfortable, and that might not necessarily be the best position when it comes to our overall posture in the body and alignment as well. Okay, kind of moving down a little bit more to the thoracic spine. I uh, just kind of want to mention we can have soft tissue injuries that affect the thoracic spine. Usually it's trauma related or fall related. We might overstretch the muscles within the thoracic spine, or we actually might have a contusion such as a fall, um, trauma due to getting hit, that type of thing, having something hit us in the thoracic spine. Those are definitely things that can cause injuries to the soft tissues uh, of our thoracic spine. Pain, swelling, decreased mobility is going to be the symptom, of course. Um, nothing really new there for the treatment. I think everything listed there makes sense. Once we have pain decreased, then really begin to get the active range of motion back. We definitely have to strengthen those muscles. Lots of thoracic extension. Um, those are the function of the muscles, extension of the spine. We're going to get back that rotation of the spine if that has been lost. Definitely think about those scapular muscles like mid-trap, uh, lower trap, and rhomboids because those are definitely going to be in need of some strengthening. We've talked about this in posture, but I wanted to mention you've got increased thoracic kyphosis. Um, this can cause pain syndromes. Typically, thoracic kyphosis doesn't come alone. It's in uh, conjunction with forward head posture and also something that might be occurring at the lumbar spine, like increased thoracic lo uh, lordosis, or it could be that you've got flexion throughout and you've got a patient that's really, really flexed throughout the lumbar and the thoracic spine. Uh, typically, that's going to be due to aging and osteoporosis. Okay, it can be congenital. It can be caused by neuromuscular conditions. So you have somebody who has a stroke or has a spinal cord injury and they have very poor positioning in the wheelchair. That can lead to thoracic kyphosis as well. Postural issues, of course, already talked about that. And then osteoporosis as a primary cause of that increased thoracic kyphosis. Sometimes your osteoporotic patients won't just have 
plain old increased thoracic kyphosis. They'll have what we call a kyphoscoliosis. So they've got not only the excess flexion in the thoracic spine, but they've got a curvature as well. And when we cover uh, scoliosis uh, next, next couple of classes, we'll talk about um, when it's combined with uh, thoracic kyphosis as well. Pain and stress occurs on that posterior longitudinal ligament. Um, this patient has stretch weakness of all of the erector spinae muscles, rhomboid muscles, mid-trap muscles. Um, in conjunction with that, if you've got the posterior side being lengthened and weak, the front side is going to be shortened and strong. So you have strengthening to do on the posterior side, you have lengthening to do on the anterior side of the body. I put treatment in um, quotations because, again, it's not kind of one size fits all. We can cure somebody's thoracic kyphosis, especially if it's somebody when it's due to a condition like osteoporosis. However, what we can do is help delay or minimize the progression of that disease. So we got to work up against gravity. They need to understand postural awareness training, whether it's at home, whether it's at work. Um, stretch those anterior shoulders and the pectoralis, strengthen the backside. Modalities might help a little bit for pain, but remember this is more of an imbalance issue, so it's not really something that you want to get into lots and lots of modalities for these patients. And then in more advanced cases, and this is, can be younger patients, older patients, we could look at some type of bracing um, in order to assist with posture and also help delay the progression of that thoracic kyphosis continuing to get worse and worse. Okay. Related to that then too is the thoracic compression fractures. Um, when you're talking about a compression fracture, you've actually got a vertebral body fracture. So typically the long axis of the vertebral body has forces put upon it. The most common area where you see is going to be in the anterior portion. So think about a person with increased thoracic kyphosis, which is your typical patient with a thoracic compression fracture, and the posture alone, like we've talked about, is going to actually cause anterior vertebral body compression. So that's your typical compression fracture is that it's affecting the anterior side of it more than the posterior. There would be a good com uh, compression fracture picture. You can see the fracture within that. You can see that flexion of the spine has contributed to that anterior compression fracture that's occurring in the vertebral body. Okay. Now, some patients with compression fractures, it doesn't have to be related to osteoporosis. You could have a younger patient that ends up with a compression fracture, typically due to a fall. Um, but when it's a fall and you kind of land on your rear end, then the compression fracture usually tends to occur in the lumbar spine. Okay, so trauma, accidents, or let's go back to that patient with osteoporosis. They bend over to pick up something off of the floor. Simple bending itself could actually bring about a compression fracture if they have low enough bone density. Um, getting up from a chair, or more commonly what I've seen is typically sitting down on a chair. So patient goes to sit down, they kind of sit down hard, they um, maybe don't have good leg strength, and so when they go to sit down, that actually brings about a compression fracture in the thoracic spine. Um, most common areas is going to be T8 to L3. In your osteoporotic person, it's usually T8 through T12. Um, you don't see as many lumbar ones that occur due to osteoporosis. Pain is probably the first and the worst symptom, and that's because of the fracture itself, but with the inflammation and depending on how the fracture looks, we might get compression of the nerve roots around um, that thoracic compression fracture area as well. Okay. The biggest thing that you need to do with your patients who have thoracic compression fractures is to avoid flexion. Um, now, if this is more of a younger person and it was a, a compression fracture that has affected both anterior and posterior part of the spine, it may be that we avoid all movements altogether. We keep the spine in neutral with a brace and we don't want to do any motions of the spine until we get some healing in there. However, for most typical patients, since it's an anterior 
part of the vertebral body affected, we would want to avoid the movements that are going to cause it to become worse, which of course would be flexion. They can be helped with pain with those modalities if need be, range of motion, posture. I like to add in good foot support. When you walk around on hard surfaces with just slipper socks on or just um, slippers only, it really does not provide a very good cushion for the body, for the lower extremity joints, or for the spine. And so I always try to educate my patients, you know, let's make sure that you're wearing good sh your shoes. They're good shoes. They're going to give you, you know, kind of that extra cushion that that spine needs right now. When the patient goes to stand up and sit down, we want to teach proper body mechanics for that. Um, the sitting down itself, you know, I'll cue my patients, pretend there's a carton of eggs sitting on the chair and you don't want to squish those eggs. Go down nice and slowly. And that might be hard for them to do at first, especially if they don't have a lot of good leg strength. Most typical exercises that we're going to prescribe are going to be extension exercises or stabilization exercises of the spine. And we haven't done much with stabilization exercises, but we will do that a little bit more when it comes to the lumbar um, spine conditions that we talk about. But we're avoiding flexion. We're improving posture. We want that patient to be um, in a more neutral position, anterior pelvic tilt take that stress off of the spine that that's going it's undergoing when it's in a flexion position with some patients they may prescribe a brace for them um, there's mixed feelings about braces if it's a multi a level compression fracture so affecting more than one level of the spine they um, may actually do a TLSL a custom brace and they'll want the patient just to avoid any movement at all um, the, the positive thing about bracing is that it helps with posture so it keeps that patient in a little bit more upright posture. If you bend, you have to bend at the hips. So you're not actually flexing at the spine, which in turn protects the spine also. Um, let's jump ahead real quick just to show a couple different type of braces. The one on the left, they can come in different types. There's Velcro ones that are simple for the patient to put on. The corset type are pretty easy for people to um, put on and adjust themselves. And then, of course, you have the TLSO. And with those, the compliance rate, very, very difficult. They're hard for a patient to put on themselves if they're not really mobile or especially in an older patient. Um, but they, they do the job of stabilizing the spine while the healing is occurring. So with both of those, um, we'll have a lab where we actually can, can practice putting on some of those or putting it on each other as if we were helping a patient put it on. The other drawback to these types of bracings is what I would call a respiratory drawback. So if you have somebody that's already respiratory compromised, whether they have COPD or whether their poor posture meant before that they really didn't get, um, they didn't breathe normally, they don't have the greatest lung uh, support, breast support, that type of thing, when you constrict them with a brace, you're making that even worse. And so sometimes when it's not prescribed by the doctor, we have to really decide ourselves from PT, is this a good idea to have the patient wear a brace? And you know, you can do some things like only have them put the brace on when they start having more pain and that type of thing, or end of the day, or if, put the brace on if they're going to be doing a lot of sitting up or standing or things like that. I also want to mention some surgical procedures which can be done if a patient is a good candidate. Um, there are two things called vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, and I'll talk about those a little bit more in class. I actually have some pretty good pictures of those. Um, a patient might be a candidate for those, and basically what they're doing is they're building back up that vertebral body. So one is with cement, one's with a balloon, uh, but the idea behind it is that um, you can usually have a patient get uh, quite a bit of pain relief um, just immediately following surgery. And they're also very short-term stay surgeries. A lot of patients go home the same day when they have uh, one of those procedures done. So we'll, we'll contrast them, and I've got a couple pictures that I'll show you guys in class. 
the last part of this, I'm not going to go through, um, but I just want you to go ahead and if you want to go through it, you can, um, just as, I, as I'm finishing talking here. These are going to be some special tests of the cervical and thoracic spine that would give us a positive or a negative in testing for some of these conditions that we've talked about. So I've got pictures of each of them. As you can see, they, the reason that we would do them, what a positive sign would indicate. These are things that are done a lot during the PT evaluation to really figure out what is going on with the patient. Um, there, the idea behind them is we're either reproducing the pain or we're alleviating the pain, and that guides us towards a PT diagnosis of, of what might be going on. Because a lot of times, our referral from the physician might just say something like neck pain or upper extremity pain. That can mean a lot. It could be a cervical problem. It could be a shoulder problem. We've got to rule all that out. And so in this section is going to be um, tests that I'll actually have you guys do and run through in class because I think it gives you a, a better ability to remember what all these tests are for and then what a positive sign would indicate. So I've got pictures throughout. We'll talk about the vertebral artery test, the ADSENS test, which is for that thoracic outlet syndrome. And then the last part of this, you can look through. These are in your exercise handout as well. But these are cervical and thoracic common exercises that we would be doing with our patients. So um, hopefully this was helpful to go through it. And it will allow us to get to lab a lot quicker, do some cases, really get some hands-on, do some manual therapy for the cervical spine, especially during class. So have a great day, and I'll see you all soon.